Welcome to the next episode of Anansai. In the last few verses, we've been hearing all about how important and valuable the Guru's wisdom is. And in these verses, we're going to be reflecting on the impact that that wisdom can have in our life. The Guru begins verse 26. By creating Shiv Shakti, the Creator itself spread its divine will. Spreading its divine will, it observes, through the Guru's instruction, only a few understand this. By breaking bonds, one becomes liberated and the word embeds in the mind. Only when it chooses does one follow the Guru and make an eternal connection with oneness. Says Nanak, it itself is the creator and it alone understands its divine will. In this verse, we see two facets of creation being introduced. This word Shiv Shakti. And whenever we come across any ancient Indian words and imagery for what are traditionally seen as gods or spirits or energies, we have to always try to decipher what those words and names and specifically the forms that they take, the way that they're represented, what do those mean? And they always have a deeper meaning and a lesson that we need to learn from. So here we're introduced to this idea of Shiv and Shakti. And what is Shiv Shakti? Now when we look at the ancient understanding of the universe, the Indian understanding divides it into three different forms, three different energies. And this is called the Trinity or the Trimurti. And you might be familiar with some of these names. You would have heard of Brahma, which represents creativity in the universe. Vishnu represents sustenance. And Shiva represents destruction. Now let's understand a little bit more about Shiva. Shiva is seen as the highest yogi, as the one who has started all schools of yoga, the one who brought all yogic wisdom to mankind. And the iconography of Shiva is very interesting. You see Shiva as someone who has a snake coiled around its neck and his skin is always this blue sort of color because his skin is covered in ashes. And all of those represent something for us to learn. Shiva really reminds us that death is always around our necks and at any time the snake of death can bite. And the blue skin that is covered in ash represents that everything that you know and everyone is eventually going to turn to dust. Everything that we experience in our life isn't going to last forever. And so Shiva is a yogi. He is trying to remind us that before death hits our body, before we reach the limit of our lives, we need to connect with something that is unlimited within us. And he's not just a yogi. He is a yogi and a family man at the same time. He has a partner and he has children. And so sometimes you see Shiva represented with his partner as well. And his partner is called Parvati or Shakti. So here Guru is talking about this Shiva and Shakti, this Shiv Shakti, this union of soul and matter, of Shiv being the life force of the universe and Shakti being the physical manifestation, form and formless. You can understand Shiv Shakti as conscious and unconscious, the yin and yang of life, creativity and destruction, masculine and feminine. And in order for the universe to function, both of these need to be working in harmony together. The yin and yang of life are always in harmony. And so what this represents is that the universe is always in ultimate balance. It's in a perfect balance and both of these things depend on each other. Neither one is better or the other. And so the universe 
the Shakti, the form that you see all around you, always has a Shiv behind it. The universe, the matter, the material world always has something behind it, has this essence, this energy, this formlessness behind it all. There's a beautiful line from Guru Nanak Dev Ji elsewhere in Gurbani where he says, Jeh dekha, teh rav rahe, Shiv Shakti ka mail. Wherever I look, I see the divine permeating as the union of Shiv and Shakti. Now, as a bit of a side note, I also want to talk a little bit about pronunciation. How do we pronounce some of these words? And when we come across words specifically from the ancient Sanskrit language, a lot of the times when ancient Sanskrit words are meant to be said, they must be said absolutely perfectly. Sanskrit is one of these languages which is very particular about pronunciation. And it places a real importance on clear pronunciation of every single letter. And specifically, whenever we see names or nouns, the last letter must be fully pronounced. And the way that this is represented when a Sanskrit word is written in English is that you'll see the letter A at the end of a Sanskrit word. And that doesn't mean that the A is a separate vowel the way we understand it in English. That's actually a representation that the word must be pronounced and the last letter has to be fully pronounced. So we see some words from Sanskrit which when you get translated into English, the word is then mistranslated or mispronounced because the A is overemphasized in English. So I want to give you a few examples just so that we understand what the real pronunciation of some of these words are. Let's take the word Ram, which is another name for God, for the divine. In Sanskrit, it would be pronounced Ram, with the last letter fully pronounced. But that A uh sound at the end is written as the letter A in English. And what a lot of the times we see people do is pronounce it as a full A, Rama. So we see this in many other examples. The word Krishna is actually in Sanskrit, Krishna. The A uh at the end is just the full pronunciation of that last letter, N, Krishna, but not Krishna. We see the words yoga, Originally, the word is yog. If we see the word dharma, the original word is dharma. There's that small a. Uh. So it's, a, it's important that we are able to understand what the original words are. Now, we do see certain names which do have a long a at the end. So if you take Brahma, that has a full a at the end. If you see Sita, that has a full A at the end. So some words in Sanskrit do have the elongated A and some have a small A and it's just important to understand how we pronounce it. Now when we look at the word Shiv, the actual word is Shiv. It's a small A but a lot of the times you'll also see Shiv pronounced as Shiva. So even in Gurbani we'll see the Shabad Dehe Shiva and wherever you see that, wherever you see a name, especially a name for the divine, with the A at the end, it tends to be where you're calling out. So we even have Shabbats in Gurbani that says Rama. And that's actually talking to Ram. So when you're calling out to Ram, you would say, Hey Rama, O Ram. So Rama is calling out, but the name is Ram. And the same with Shiva. So it's important that we understand how this is being used in its original context and how it changes over time. And I'm not one of these people that believes that language is static. In fact, if we look, all languages are constantly evolving and moving. Certainly as words move to different regions and different areas, then we begin to see the words start to change and evolve. And now a lot of ancient spiritual words from the Indian traditions, from Sanskrit particularly, is now making its way into English. So we will see words like yoga, mantra, karma. And it's not that we need to go and correct people and say that you're not pronouncing it correctly. It's now that those ancient words have now taken a life of their own into English. So it's okay in English to pronounce it as yoga, mantra. 
But it's also important when we're reading, when we're trying to understand the original context that we also know what the original pronunciation is as well. So now that we understand a little bit about the context of who Shiva is and, and, and how do we pronounce it, let's go back to verse 26 and see what does Guru say about this Shiv Shakti. Guru starts the verse by saying, Shiv Shakat Aap Upayake Karta Ape Hukam Vartai. By creating Shiv Shakti, the Creator itself spread its divine will. The universe is created with a fusion, a fusion of the oneness itself. The soul of the oneness infused itself, its life force, its consciousness into physical matter in order to create the universe. And only when this fusion happened did the flow of life begin. And this is being called the divine will or the hukam. So we need to understand that oneness is both Shiv and Shakti. Oneness is both soul and matter. And if the whole of the universe is a combination of both of these things, then it means that you are also a combination of these things. You are a combination of divine light or soul and divine form or body. But the most important thing to remember and the wisdom that the Guru is starting to give us here, neither of these are yours. Shiv and Shakti do not belong to you. Your soul, your consciousness, your life force and your body is something that is not yours. And you have both this Shiv Shakti inside you. You are already in perfect harmony with both of these things. So it's important when we realize that we're not just one or the other, we're actually both in most cases, that we don't identify with just one form. Look in your own life, there have been so many times where you've had to be creative and destructive, where you've had to be fierce and gentle, where you've had to have patience at times and at other times you've had to be really assertive and, and, and do a lot of action. You've been participating in things and at times you've been detached from things. There are times to be serious and there are times to be playful. At times you've demonstrated masculine traits and at other times you've demonstrated quite feminine traits. You are both body and spirit. So you are already a perfect balance of both of these qualities and both of these are flowing through you harmoniously. When life energy combined with your body, only then did the flow of your life begin. And let's look at the flow of your own life. Look at all the different things that have happened in your life. As soon as you were born, growth started, aging started, thoughts began, memories started to form, desires arose within you and from those desires you had actions, you took action in order to fulfill those desires. And when you did actions, there may have been certain reactions. Sometimes things have happened and based on your thoughts, based on your own conditioning, you've reacted to all these things. So when we begin to understand that all of these things are happening naturally to you, then we begin to realize that this is nothing to do with me. This is all happening by nature's own law. This is hukam. This is the universe just acting out through us. And this is what Guru is beginning to try and make us understand a little bit more about who we are and how we function. The Guru goes on to say, Hukam vartai aap vekhe gurmuk kise bujhai. Spreading its divine will, it observes. Through the Guru's instruction, only few understand this. The fact of the matter is most of the time we're completely oblivious to what is really happening in our life. And there are only very few people who recognize the harmonious flow that is happening all around them and through them. But most of us are so caught up in our story. We're so caught up in our day-to-day -day interactions and the things that need to happen that we completely forget this one fact that this isn't about us. We are not responsible for what is going on here. We weren't responsible for our birth. We weren't responsible for our growth. 
A lot of the times we're not even responsible for our thoughts. They're just a natural occurrence based on the interactions that this body has had with its surroundings. You see that nothing around you is yours. One of the things I like to think about is when you look in the mirror, even your own face isn't yours. You've had very little to do with that face that you see in the, in, in the reflection. You didn't even make your face. And yet your mind identifies it as mine. I, th I like to think about the mind as a labeling system and everything that it sees, it places a label on. This is mine, this is not mine. This is friend, this is enemy. I like this, I don't like that. So based on how the mind has seen the world, experienced the world, the mind begins to start labeling, labeling everything. And what it also does is it thinks about itself and labels itself as me. I am the owner of this body and I am the owner of these thoughts. I'm the creator of these thoughts. If the thoughts exist, they must belong to someone. And because I'm the only one that can hear them, I'm the only one that can experience them. So they must belong to me. I must be the creator of these thoughts. And so this is where the spiritually enlightened masters have told us that your mind naturally mislabels what is really here. It mislabels things with the wrong word. The use of this word Shabbat is very important. Shabbat is the words, the words that are going on in your head. And your mind has used the wrong words to understand itself, to think about itself, and then interact with the world through that mislabeling of itself. So, when we listen to the Guru, the Guru starts to awaken us. The Guru starts to help us realize that you're not the true owner of these things. These are not your eyes that are seeing the world. It is the eyes of the body which has been created by the universe. So I like to think of the Guru as reprogramming the mind. The mind naturally tries to come up with its own words, with its own understanding of, of how it is, who it is, and how it needs to engage with the world. And the Guru is the one with the refined mind, the one who has learnt to overcome some of the misconceptions of the mind itself. So the Guru is reprogramming. I like to think of it as a software upgrade, a new way of thinking. And what does the new way of thinking teach us? It teaches us that your body, your thoughts, your awareness, all of these things are nothing to do with you. They were created by life and they will go back to life. And when you realize this about yourself, you begin to see that the spirit of life is within me and the spirit of life is also within everything I see. Everything all around me has that oneness, that one life force, that one life energy. Everything that is happening around you is that flow of life itself. You begin to realize that events in life are not happening to you. They happen through you. So this power, this life force, this light, whatever we want to call it, that force that is within you and when you begin to understand it the delusion of you begins to disappear and this is what the guru is always trying to make us understand you are not really you this is nothing to do with you this body this mind this thoughts this life this story that you've created about yourself is never your story it's the story of life everything belongs to life so what do we do about it? How do we shake ourselves away from this? The Guru goes on to say, Tore bandhan hove mukt, shabd manvasai. By breaking bonds, one becomes liberated and the word embeds in the mind. This is a really important idea here that it takes the mind to really begin to understand these words and the words really have to penetrate into the mind. And when these things begin to happen, certain things and changes begin to happen in your life. Bonds begin to break. But until that happens, you are bound and tied by your misguided perceptions. 
The main misconception that we all walk around with is that you are meant to gain something out of life. Let me say that again. The main misconception that every single one of us has is that we are here to gain something out of life. And when we have this misconception, we create attachments. This mindset convinces us that life is all about trying to get as much as we can. And so we develop this thinking that we are here to own things and we somehow have a capability of keeping hold of these things. You know, sometimes you hear people say that you've come into this world with nothing and that you leave with nothing. I think it's slightly different than that. I think you came into this world with quite a lot, but you must leave with nothing. Think about it. When you were born, you came with a body. You came with a mother and father, and maybe when you were born, your parents took you home so you had a home to go to. Maybe they wrapped you in nice clothes and they gave you food to eat. So when you came into this world, you came into a lot of different things. But when you leave, you must leave it all behind. Absolutely nothing can go with you. And so if you believe that life is about gaining things, then you're always trying to get more. There is never a point when the perception of the mind is all about gain, then there's never a point where that gain has been satisfied. Because the very way that you think about life is that life is about achieving. Life is about getting. Life is about getting as much as you can and keeping hold of as much as you can. So we're all walking around with this idea, this misconception, that life is about gaining things. The spiritual master knows that life is really about losing things. The master knows that there is nothing that you can hold on to. So rather than living life with this gain mentality, with this mindset of always trying to reach out for more and getting more, it's about realizing that nothing that you have, nothing that you gain will stay. So you start creating internal barriers not allowing yourself to create such strong emotional bonds that when those things eventually go, which they will, that you don't know how to deal with it because you went into that relationship with that wrong mentality. I always say that every human interaction and every relationship that you go into, you must go into with the idea that this isn't going to last. A lot of the times the modern world doesn't know how to deal with that, doesn't know how to even process that statement that I've just made because they think that absolutely that's the wrong way to go into a relationship. You must go into a relationship trying to make it last. Now, I'm not saying that you must go in with a mindset to try and break all relationships. You must go with the mindset that this relationship, no matter what, eventually has to be something that I am willing to let go of. And it doesn't mean that I'm irresponsible and that I don't look after my my family and my children and I, and, I, and I never really create a strong bond with people and I don't think that that's, that's the right way to think about it at all. The idea is that you can have all this loving relationships and long-term fulfilling family bonds and ties and friendships with people, but there has to be an awareness, something at the back of your mind that always realizes this isn't going to last and I would rather be okay with that realization now. I need to come to terms with that realization now. So when you begin to realize that there is a divine word, a Shabbat, a flow, a universal system that is controlling absolutely everything, what it allows you to have is it allows you to have freedom. And that's where this word Mukt comes in here. Freedom from what though? You're not free from your responsibilities, you're not free from your family ties or your relationships. What you ultimately become free from is free from yourself. The bond that you have created with yourself is the ultimate bondage, is the ultimate thing that's tying you down. And the Guru's wisdom is constantly trying to make you understand nothing is yours. There is nothing that you can look at that is yours. 
And so, until that point, you are bound and you are trapped and you are asleep. You don't realize this is going on. And as soon as the Guru comes, the wisdom comes and embeds within your mind, you begin to awaken. You begin to realize that you are trapped in your own perceptions. You begin to understand that how you've been functioning so far is an unhealthy way to function. And so this idea that we're all walking around with that I am something, I am someone important, this creates this mentality that you're owed things in life. That life is something that you have to gain things from and that life owes you something. Now, there are other types of people who say, that's not me. Life doesn't owe me anything. In fact, life has never given me anything. And they walk around with a similar variation of this mentality, which is life has never given me anything, but it's still about gaining things. So I'm just going to take whatever I can. And I'm going to take because I deserve something. And notice that they're very similar concepts. They're still based on this idea that I need to gain something out of life. And either way, however way, whichever way you think, you create amazing fantasies about how your life should be. Now, when life doesn't turn out according to our fantasies, that's when we begin to suffer. And so the Guru is realizing that this is what's happening in human beings. And the Guru comes with a solution that says, I'm here to free you from yourself. I'm here to free you from everything that's tying you down. And the way that you find freedom is that you break your attachments. You break your attachments to your own make-believe stories in your head. These stories about who we are and what our purpose is in life. The Guru says, let's break all of those misconceptions. And so when the Guru and the wisdom begins to penetrate in your mind, you will no longer be bound to the idea of the myself. The Guru goes on to say, Gurmuk jisnu aap kare so hove, ek live lai. Only when it chooses does one follow the Guru and make an eternal connection with oneness. For some few people, the flow of life takes us out of this misconception, takes us from a state of being unaware to being aware through the Guru's word, through the wisdom of oneness itself. The wisdom has the ability and the power to elevate us from this darkness to light. Remember what the word Guru means. Gu is darkness, Ru is light. And the darkness is our own thinking. And the Guru begins to reprogram you. And when you are reprogrammed, you are reunited with that true self, that true oneness that is behind your body, the true Shiv that is behind the Shakti, the soul behind the form itself. And how does this programming happen? How does this retraining of the mind happen? It is through the word of the Guru, through the wisdom through the Nam, Nam being the practice of awareness. And Nam, the practice of awareness, has to lead you to your final destination, which is Name, not me. That is the purpose of Nam, to take you from the Me, the I am, to I am not. From Me to Name, from Ho Me to not me. And through Nam, mind begins to remember who it really is and it realizes I am not me. So this verse is all about union, combining, taking something that is believed to be two and realizing that it is always one. Because in our minds, we and the universe are separate. There's always a me and there's always the other. There's always me and there's everything else. And so when we walk around with this way of thinking, we don't realize that we're actually split in our daily experience. We're actually not whole. We are incomplete. And 
we don't realize that we're incomplete, but we feel it. Somewhere deep within us, we know every morning that we wake up, we don't feel complete. We don't feel satisfied. We don't wake up completely free from any desires. And desires are our way of trying to fill that uncomfortable void, that emptiness that's inside of us. And we know that there's something missing in our life. And, and the only way that we can solve that, that problem is that we think we look outside. We look to the world and say, what else did I not gain from the world? What else am I missing? Because I've spent all of my life gaining things from the world, but I wake up every morning and I still don't feel full. The solution we don't realize is not about gaining. We think let's, it, it must be because we haven't gained enough. We need to get, gain more things. And so we yearn for anything to fill this gap within us. We know that we're incomplete in our lives. And when we've tried to gain all the things in our life, when we've realized that all the material possessions that we could go out and buy, we've gone and got them, then we go on a spiritual journey. And then we try and realize something that we can't grab, something that's not physical, something that we can't touch. And so even in seeking God or seeking enlightenment, we maintain a duality. We maintain a me that is looking for something called a God that is out there somewhere. And the Guru is always saying, no, it's never out there. It's always been there. It's always in you. In the last line, Guru ends by saying, Keh Nanak, aap karta, aap hukum bujhaye. Says Nanak, it itself is the creator and it alone understands its divine will. The Guru is always trying to take away your duality, your split thinking, which is that there is a me and there is something else that I have to try and gain. And the Guru is saying there is no you. There is only it. It itself is the seeker who is seeking itself. It is the seeker who realizes its true self. So you are God looking for God. And that takes a moment when we hear it to process and say, I don't understand that. How can I be God? If I'm really God, then why don't I feel like it? The reason you don't feel like it is because you are in the way. And the moment you drop the search, you realize all along that you have been the barrier. You have been the one that has blocked you from realizing the totality of what you really are. Because God cannot go anywhere. And I'm, I realize that I'm starting to use this word God in the, in the end of this verse because it's not a word that I'm particularly fond of. But it seems to make sense here because th that's the way that we think. We've created the word God in order to separate this thing from us. We've created something that is outside, bigger, creator, the father figure. And so by, by, by doing this, we maintain this idea that I am me and God is God. But the reality is God is everything. It is you. It is everything and everywhere. God cannot go anywhere else because that's the only thing that is here. It is here right now and it is in everything and it is in every place. So everywhere you see is God looking at God. Think about that for a moment. Everything that you're looking at, the one looking is also God. It isn't you. There isn't a me. Now, when we say these things, one of the things that we have to realize is there is a trap here that we need to be aware of. You mustn't listen to this and come to the conclusion that I am God. This is a trap that you must avoid. In Vedanta, which is the oldest, most ancient teachings of non-duality and oneness, there are four major truths, ultimate statements that are called Mahavakyas. And one of these supreme truths is Aham Brahmasmi, I am the supreme reality. Now, although this statement is absolutely true, there is a trap for ordinary folk like you and me in making that statement. Because when we do that, when we say, I am the ultimate reality, I am God, what we do is that we retain a small amount of I amness. 
And that's because our minds are not trained in this way of thinking. We don't know how to really make this statement without retaining the I am. So we need really a very sophisticated insight into our own lives, into our own minds, into our own egos. And if we don't have that, the ego can subtly trick you into making this statement and retaining the small me. You know, it, it, it likes to then hold on to some element of me and say, well, at least I am still here. And that's not what this statement means. This statement doesn't mean the me, the individual character that I thought I was, is still here. The individual character is not the supreme reality. The supreme reality is the individual character. It's as though the wave is saying, I am the whole ocean. Now that wouldn't be technically correct. In one sense, you might say, of course, the wave and the ocean are the same. But the wave cannot say, I am the entire ocean. But the ocean can say, I am the wave. And so we have to understand where this statement is coming from and how, if we're not careful, if we're untrained, how we may misuse this statement and we may retain this level of ego that we're so unaware of. There was a famous 9th century Sufi mystic called Mansur, and he was actually hanged for making a very similar statement. He said, An al haq I am the ultimate truth. And he was hanged for it because although he was absolutely right, nobody else could understand his experience. Nobody could understand what he was really talking about, and they believed him to be the ultimate sinner. How can you call yourself God? But he was not saying that I am God. He was saying, everything is God, including me. And so when we come across terms like self-realization, this untrained ego thinks that self-realization means that I must know myself better. Or worse still, people use these amazingly spiritual terms for really ego-based purposes. And they say things like self-realization means that I must fulfill my own desires or I have to live my own life and I have to follow my dreams and not care about what anyone else thinks. And this is absolutely not what this spiritual statement means. Self-realization is not about following your own passions and desires. It's not about retaining your individual character that you call me. The Guru wants you to break that. Guru wants you to get away from this trap. So. The Guru's way, especially within the Sikh spiritual tradition, within Gurmat, the Guru's way of speaking the truth never includes I am in the truth. It very rarely says I am the ultimate truth. The Guru's way is saying you are the truth. You are the ultimate reality. God is everything. Everything is you and only God can know God. And this is what Guru is saying in this last line. Kehe nanak aap karta. Nanak says that you are the creator. It itself is the creator and it only knows itself. And the Guru concludes this verse with this understanding. This is all you. This very moment is you. This very space is you. And this observer is you. And even this realization is ultimately yours. Answer the following questions either by writing them down or discussing them in your groups. What is truly yours in life? Which attachments do you consider to be the most difficult to recognize? What methods do you think will help you reduce your attachments? How easy is it to recognize the universal force as the doer of all things in your life?